And I begin with uh, two quotations which cover, I think, important aspects of the whole area of indicators. One's from Jessinghaus, and he talks about how aggravated, sorry, <laughs> ag aggregated environmental indicators have been defined as executive summaries of complex realities. I think that's a succinct comment which reflects on the nature of biodiversity, the fact that it is such a complex beast and that managing it means measuring it, but measuring biodiversity is not quite easy. And yet you have to do it because otherwise uh, senior guys in policy space or senior guys in business just don't know what you're talking about. There's no point flooding them with complexity because what they respond to, in fact, is simplicity. And, and the second com comment is from Samuelson and Nordhaus, and that talks about the power of indicators. In fact, it uses GDP to make that point, saying that without measures of economic aggregates like GDP, policymakers would be adrift in a sea of unorganized data, which kind of, for those who are familiar with the space, describes the biodiversity world today. It's a sea of unorganized data, and you'll, when I talk, you'll see a bit about what I mean. And they go on to say that GDP and related data are like beacons that help policymakers steer the economy towards the key economic objectives. Okay, so it's a debate as to whether GDP is a good indicator to identify the best policy objectives for the betterment of society. That's a separate point, but the point they're making is that you need this. If you don't, then you've got policymakers in a drift in a sea. What is for TEAB in this space the key challenge? And I would say that the key challenge really is it's about measurement because a lot of what we are talking about, whether it's looking at the use of uh, valuation in policy or looking at the use of valuation in business or in local administration or even in communications, if you don't measure, how will you actually project? If you can't project, how will you actually convince? If you can't convince, what kind of management will you have? And I think that's really the, the essence here, that we need to improve the way that we measure biodiversity. Otherwise, we don't stand a snowball's hope in hell of trying to manage the kind of losses that we are seeing nowadays. Improve the way we measure biodiversity to ensure proper stewardship of natural capital. This is actually a quote straight out of the TD1 book. And just a quick uh, uh, sort of thing, a quick uh, update as to what are indicators. I think. We need to recognize both the measuring and the managing aspect of it. And we, if we think of indicators as, as measures which point out the direction of changes across different units and through time, we need to look at the measuring aspect and recognize that we are talking about measuring what is happening to biodiversity and why, and then you know, where, is, where is it going? And then we need to talk about the managing, and a lot of the managing comes down to how will you communicate what you've found. And the communication is actually key because we are talking about communicating in a clear and simple way messages about what is happening to biodiversity and why. And that applies as much to the common man and creating the right feeling of groundswell of, of uh, intent and emotion as much as it applies to policymakers, as much as it applies to businesses. So these aspects of uh, the indicators that we are talking about really have to be borne in mind when, when you're looking at this space. Now, there are many, unfortunately, I talk about key messages, but actually there are quite a few messages because we are talking about how important indicators can be in the whole challenge of halting biodiversity and ecosystem losses. Because firstly, they're about identifying the trends and the conditions. Very often, we are about finding the gaps and filling the gaps. Secondly, it's about measuring progress because we have to look at the the effectiveness as well as the cost efficiency of whatever strategy or policy we are talking about. Then thirdly, they're about benchmarking and monitoring performance. So unless you know how effective or cost effective you're being, you're not gonna be able to convince a repeated use of the same set of indicators for addressing the problem of the policy challenge at hand. And overall, really, it's about policymakers being able to get to grips with a set of policy challenges. They need these indicators. So what that does is, is imposes certain requirements on this whole space of indicators because we want to capture the overall picture of what's happening. We want to provide an integrated framework. In other words, we can't just have isolated pockets of changes being measured and presented. You have to look at it from a holistic perspective as what are the social implications, what are the economic implications, what you need to 
measure specifically to build the picture and then to provide the means of uh, measuring and managing that picture, if you like. And that means that you need to go beyond just the static picture, as in what is the status of biodiversity, how many species, how much density of, of biomass, or, or what is the, the mean species abundance. You can't stop at just the static picture, as in the today's balance sheet of biodiversity, but you've got to see where the changes are coming from and what implications those changes have towards poverty, towards uh, uh, well-being of people generally, and, and towards the underlying framework of the natural world. And you need very often to also understand your knowledge gaps in this process because you will find knowledge gaps. And you need to set the baselines because an indicator is always describing either a space or, or a time. And there's usually a baseline, there's usually a reference point. So you need to decide what reference points and how you select those reference points will make a difference on your assumptions and your, and your management strategies. And finally, you need to indicate them because basically you're building either uh, a series of, of uh, a cross space or you're building a time series. And those are useful efforts, but the thing is they are needed. And then the question is consistency because if you are, have a set of strategies which is addressing biodiversity losses and challenges, you can't have a different, particularly when you have spaces next to each other, you can't have completely different indicators because otherwise there will be confusion and there will be uh, not necessarily uh, a good strategy for overall reduction in losses. So these are some of the issues that, that you need to look at. And basically what we are talking about also is going away from the biophysical indicators, you need to also look at the economic indicators, the macro, including the macroeconomic indicators. How are we reflecting a lot of this economic invisibility? How are we bringing it into the overall framework? Because at the end of the day, it's the same policy makers. As, as I've said many times before, in any developing country, biodiversity strategy and development uh, strategy, biodiversity policy and development policy are really you know, two sides of the same coin. You can't isolate one from the other. Uh, it doesn't work. Now, what this means is clearly there's a challenge in finding the right indicators. And the first question is, well, how's it going? Are people being able to find the right indicators? So let me give you a, a graph which is actually an indicator of indicators. So this, this is a graph which is from the UN, which is from the UNDP Office of uh, uh, Development Studies. And they are measuring the number of national indicators that there are for measuring various kinds of progress at the national level. And what it tells us basically with this sort of huge increase that you're seeing between the 1980s and 1990s and now is that just the sheer volume of indicators that are being created is, is humongous. And uh, that also underlies some of the challenge. How do you decide when you've got 20 different indicators kind of measuring what you're trying to measure, but none of them actually exactly measuring what you want? Which one do you choose? And that's an actual challenge that policymakers have to address from, from, uh, from their vantage and which uh, specialists and academicians and experts have to help them address. So this is part of the problem. The, the complexity is in fact sometimes worsened by just the sheer number of solutions that are being found to address that complexity. So what all is out there? Well, some of the, let me just identify some of the key indicators that are out there being discussed and which are relevant for our world, for the TEAB world, if you like. There is the HDI, the Human Development Index. Interestingly, this indicator is not directly measuring anything to do with the environment or with ecosystems. And yet, indirectly, there's a lot. So how many of you are familiar with HDI? How many are familiar with its composition? Okay, cool. So basically you'd be aware that it's got three broad components. One is an, an economic uh, component, if you like, which is basically GDP per capita. Another is a health component, which is, as it happens, measured in terms of the longevity. Now you could argue that longevity is not a good way of assessing health because how long you live is not necessarily mean that you live a healthy life, but the fact is, you need a metric, and that's what's been chosen. And the third is education, and that is also measured in a sort of not perfectly satisfactory way because we measure literally the number of years of expected schooling. And uh, can anyone guess which is the country which has the highest schooling in number of years? Yeah. No, but yeah, you're kind of thinking in the right direction. Keep going. Cuba. Sorry? Cuba. Cuba? <laughs> no, not this one. Sorry, you can't give me the same answer for every question and expect to be right. Come on. <laughs> Think again. Norway. Norway. It's interesting you should say that because you're from Australia and the answer is it's Australia, actually. <laughs> yes, that's right. 
<laughs> I'll remember this, though. <laughs> yeah, it's a large number of years. And I think maybe it's because Australians go in and out of school and go in for further schooling and universities. Total schooling includes university as well. So the, the, there are these measures of, of uh, well-being, if you like, which comprise HDI. Now, schooling and, and nature doesn't necessarily have much to do with each other. Health clearly is impact, impacted by the quality of nature and ecosystems. And clearly, the ability of uh, people to have a high per capita income also has some relationship to how much natural wealth and how much natural product flows into the economy, but it's not well captured. So there are links, but they are tenuous links. They're not strong links. And in fact, this year, uh, HDI, the committee, uh, I, I'm part of that committee, has been looking at ways in which you can get nature and environment more directly into the measure of HDI, and work is still progressing in that, in that vein. Another indicator which is pretty commonly talked about in the context of biodiversity and development is Red List, the IUCN Red List, which is really just a scarcity indicator. It's a measure of the uh, species which are uh, either close to extinction or are threatened. So there are these red list indicators. Another group uh, that somehow comes up a lot is simply because it's measured. Sometimes indicators are talked about because people measure them. So the, the, um, the wild bird index, I mean, why the hell would that be such a popular thing? It doesn't tell you a lot apart from how many wild, yeah. Birders yeah. have an incredible amount of data. Yeah, like birders, yeah. We know a lot about birds, so, so it's like not, not because it's, you know, in some absolutist sense highly important or significant, but because there are lots of birders and they do spend a lot of their time just measuring how many bird counts. So therefore we have lots of very good data on this. There's time series, there's the works, and it's geographically dispersed. And because it's a global sort of community, pretty much people use the same standards for bird counts. So you can actually compare, you know, whatever, barn owls in England versus barn owls in Himachal Pradesh in India, you can actually have a comparable count. And this is useful. But unfortunately, it's about birds. So the question is, how good, how good or useful an indicator is that? And, and then, of course, even from out here in Yale, we've got uh, uh, Dynasties or, and other people's EPI, the Environmental Performance Index. So essentially, there's a lot of these. And it's quite difficult to see the wood from the trees. And I haven't even finished. So there's a whole long list which will come up again and again whenever you are in the space of discussion of indicators with policymakers. You will see many of these coming up. There's the Living Planet Index, which is somewhat related to the footprint, the, the uh, uh, Global Footprint Networks Indicator of Ecological Footprint. Uh, there's the EPI I mentioned, HDI, various uh, indices, including the SEBI indicators of the European Union. Um, there's about 23, 26 of them. And then there's a CBD indicators, about 29, 30 of them. So there's quite a few indicators which are considered relevant for the world of ecosystems and biodiversity. How do you make sense out of these? Well, broadly speaking, there are three ways of classifying all these indicators. So one way is to look at which space, which uh, space of, of human well-being are they impacting? Is it more in the economic side, more on the social side, or more on the environmental side? And of course, you, there's a kind of Venn diagram which you can draw which covers, covers these. And uh, if you look at uh, the sort of cross between economic and environmental spaces, there's of course um, not very much unless you go into the green GDP and genuine savings space. Uh, HDI is sort of kind of touching upon uh, the crossover point between all three, but not really. It's mainly between social and, uh, and economic. Um, and then you've got various indicators which are purely social indicators. You've got green GDP and inclusive wealth, which inclusive wealth is sort of in the center space. Green GDP is, is more in the space between economic and environmental wealth. And, uh, and then you've got this whole armory of, of indicators which is available for measuring ecological and environmental factors, including the CBD indicators, the uh, SEBI indicators of the European Union, um, uh, the red list indices, the footprint, and so on and so forth. A second way of cutting the same population of indicators is to not say like which area of well-being are they addressing, are they measuring, but rather what are they like? I mean, what kind of indicators are they? Are they um, single indicators? I mean, do they measure something like CO2? Are they basket indicators? Are they composite indices? Are they national income account related? So that's another way of classifying them, rather in the manner in which they measure or what they measure, as against the area which they, their measurement can impact. And yet a third way is to look at this whole idea of, of drivers and pressures. In other words, are they 
helpful in measuring the state of ecosystems and biodiversity, or are they more helpful in identifying what are the pressure points and what are the drivers of loss of biodiversity? Or uh, are they actually measures of policy response? What's been done about it, and therefore what is the impact of what's been done about it? So you can classify it in, in that sense as well, and then see whether they are more about pressures or drivers, uh, whether they're more about responses or the state of biodiversity. And the reality is, in fact, that the whole space is uh, complex because you have to see what indicators are used for. And that's perhaps the most important question to ask, like who uses these and why? What are they used for? So you'll find, for instance, red lists being used a lot in the scientific community in terms of uh, identifying uh, extinction approaching species and so on. Uh, SEBI indicators are used a lot in managing, especially in the European Union, not surprising. And you have a host of indicators like the footprint and the human development, which are there in the space of public discussion, but also being used in, in terms of goal setting and policy making. And then finally, there's a lot which goes into just pure analytics and good research papers. So there are, there are actually different uses, different users and different uses for these indicators as well. If we, if we look at what, what questions need to be asked when you're, when you're trying to either prescribe policy or evaluate uh, a local area and its, its administrative uses or looking at a business and you want to try and identify an indicator to make it relevant, make, the, you know, make that uh, executive summary for the, for the people, the decision makers that you're addressing, you need to ask some of these questions like, what am I using these for? Can they be, dis can they be developed to do the job? Um, has this been useful somewhere else? Is this the first time this is happening, or can I quote an established precedent of this particular indicator being used to address that particular problem? And uh, is it easier to link them to smart objectives, or is it more difficult to do so? Um, is there a need for this? Is this a great indicator that deserves to be more used and better used, and therefore I'm trying to bring it into the dialogue? Um, is there a best approach, or should I be more honest and just talk about the three different ways of addressing this? And that's a question that you will have to ask and answer. And how do these uh, reflect at different scales? Is this a good indicator only at a national and local level, or does it apply globally? Or is it just only apply globally, and there's not much point discussing it at the local level? So these are some questions that you must ask of the indicators that you are bringing into your discussion, no matter what it's applying to whether it's at the policy level, local level, business level, or communications. And you need to deduce from the analysis of indicators a few things. Now, you have to talk about, you have to see to what extent they impact communications. You have to see whether they are uh, really going to be useful for addressing well-being, because dialogue is going to move in that direction, uh, more, more likely than not when, when you're addressing policy and whether they're going to help you complement or counterbalance. Um, and then finally, given that the dialogue will get to the national level and that there is GDP and that there are well-known defects with GDP and the economic invisibility of, of nature and, and ecosystem services, how is this going to play into that space? You have to address that. So I think these are some of the questions that you definitely have to ask. And from there, let me just look at what about us, as in uh, from a TEAB perspective, what what should be our focus? And I think this is actually a debate which is still going on, even though there is a view presented in the TEAB report. I, I must confess that even I disagree with the consensus view. I mean, I, I, as TEAB study leader, I've always got to go with the consensus view, but I had developed in the course of this debate my own views as to what is important for the TEAB approach. Um, so let me just describe that for a moment. There, there was, uh, uh, the consensus view was that from our perspective, because it's about uh, measuring economic value, that we should try and be as simple as possible and as succinct as possible and really bring this down not to a horde of indicators but just three indicators. And uh, that was basically about measuring three attributes of biodiversity. One is species diversity, for which we need species indicators. The other is just the sheer volume, if you like, of, of the space that is occupied by biodiversity hotspots, the areas of ecosystems, because we know that natural ecosystems are under threat and the area, uh, the rate of decline of the area of natural ecosystems is one of the measures in which they are, in which that has been reflected. And the third was the quality of ecosystems, which of course then takes you to the space of 
the ecosystem services. It, it takes you to whether there's resilience or not, or whether the ecosystem is close to a threshold or not. And it talks about just the sheer value of ecosystem service flows that comes from that ecosystem. So these were the three that the TEEB community decided that they should try and focus on, and therefore you'll see a lot written about that. And of course, when it comes to quality, that kind of opens the, the gate, the floodgates into the, the whole area of uh, the MA service framework, the TEEP service framework derived from the MA and the valuation of those and the various frameworks and methodologies that are used by TEEP for these valuations. So that was the consensus view. Um, and we have to also watch out because we are trying to be, uh, um, we're trying to simplify. The question is, do you want to simplify to a point where you end up with the mistakes of the past? And GDP at the end of the day is a simplification. Uh, it's not as if in creating GDP, the creators were unaware of the fact that it was an incomplete measure. In fact, um, I think Sanjeev, you pointed this out in one of your, one of your writings. Stone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stone, uh, in, when he got his Nobel Prize way back in 1984, who was one of Mead and Stone were the two people, two economists involved in the creation of the National Accounting Framework, the SNA as it's called. And Stone pointed out in his Nobel uh, laureate lecture, in his speech, that um, their work in the uh, late 40s, early 50s was incomplete because they hadn't really had time due to the pressures of, of what they were doing to look at the social dimensions and the environmental dimensions. And he said that uh, today, as in 1984, there was a lot more work available on the environmental dimensions of uh, the accounts of society and therefore it should be possible to make progress there. But of course that was 1984 and we are still 2011, 20, 27 years later, not really not haven't made much progress, but that's uh, the fact is that even the creators of the SNA framework and GDP as its bellwether indicator recognize its inadequacies. Now the question is, are we in trying to simplify biodiversity indicators going to end up with the same sort of problem, but on the biodiversity side and the ecosystem service side? Well, that's something to watch out for. So how do we prevent that? Well, this is a personal perspective and let me differentiate that from what the TEAB approach is. The way I see it is to first, let's go back to this whole area of biodiversity. And you recognize this slide. This is one of the earliest slides that you would have seen in terms of the official definition of biodiversity and how in order to encompass uh, quantum and quantity in that definition, which is a dimension of biodiversity, is the amount that you have. Uh, the mean species abundance is an example of the amount. It is important because abundance makes a huge difference in terms of how much food, fiber, and fuel wood or how much design inspiration or whatever pollination is being provided as economic value by natural ecosystems. And abundance aspects come in in very different ways. So you have to look at what is biodiversity in terms of all of these uh, three tiers of ecosystem species and genes. You have to look at their quality and their quantity dimensions. Recognize that all of them deliver some form of ecosystem service and then come to perhaps uh, something like five fundamental attributes of biodiversity, uh, which in my opinion cover the majority of what you need to measure in order to be able to manage. Mm -hmm. So I think you definitely need a measure of species richness because if you are looking at diverse, diversity in species, then you're certainly targeting various, all the way from literally the rural communities, medicinal values, making use of those uh, species for medicines all the way out to uh, ecotourism values from species diversity. And you're looking at ecosystem resilience. You remember from Tom Barker's lecture in terms of how important that uh, the diversity richness aspect is for resilience. Secondly, you need to look at this, the species rarity dimension because the fact is because ecotourism is important and because there is huge willingness to pay for rare species and especially species close to extinction, there is a massive economic impact of that uh, rarity and therefore you get huge values. Very often you see uh, studies of ecosystem services and you find ecotourism has massive values simply because of this high willingness to pay aspect or just the, the sheer size of, of ecotourism in certain economies. Now, the third aspect is what I kind of broadly call biomass but actually biomass is both a combination of area as well as of density and biomass is important because it's the fish biomass that is food. It's the, it's the uh, forest biomass that is giving us a lot of the water stabilization and, and soil stabilization and soil formation functions of ecosystems. So you need to look at biomass overall and then figure out how you will measure that. And two elements of that measurement is density. And I'll come to this in the examples from the GIST work, uh, the green accounting work that I'll come later. But we have actually got to measure both area as well as, as the density. 
and figure out how that moves with time and across space. The fourth dimension is what I call primary productivity. And there's a lot of good work done on this. There's an index, an indicator called HANP, Human Appropriation of Net Primary Productivity. And HANP is a way of saying, look, a natural area produces a certain amount of biomass. And you can modify that natural area by introducing agriculture in some form or the other. You can keep modifying it, but you have to sort of work within the boundaries of how much of the biomass that is produced, how much of the natural primary productivity is uh, consumed or preempted by humans. And there are points, there's a sort of diagram that you will come across, which uh, beyond a point, you will find that the, uh, the primary productivity declines, and then it has to be really fed in and supplemented by fertilizers and so on. But you can, to a point, feed the human populations and maintain basic ecosystem functions. But beyond a point, uh, you find that primary productivity in a particular area will suffer. And then you need to supplant it with agricultural um, uh, fertilizers and so on. And primary productivity, is, primary productivity is important because it is finally about providing food. And in the case of fisheries, I think this is also very, very vital because a lot of the strategies that you heard earlier about managing fisheries through regional organizations and through local uh, policy uh, instruments, um, a couple of weeks back you had people from Conservation International talking about that. So these aspects are about ensuring that primary productivity in fisheries is managed to a point where stocks are healthy and they provide uh, good catches and, and good economic returns. And last but not the least is genetic diversity, because that is vital when it comes to bioprospecting and when it comes to the insurance, the underlying insurance value that the ecosystem, uh, that, that uh, genetic diversity provides, that is important. So I would imagine that if you really wanted to simplify, you'd need to go down to uh, no less than five different dimensions or five different attributes of biodiversity. And the, the sad thing is that if I were to hand on heart say, well, do we have indicators for each of these? Uh, let's, let's think. I mean, can anyone think of a species richness indicator? Yeah, go on. We could take, I mean, there's, there's various projects that have mapped species distribution and mm. we could just take, could you like taxonomic? Yeah. Things. We could simply do that, but that's on a very coarse scale. It's a coarse scale, and, and uh, it will not necessarily give you total species. I mean, it, it'll, it'll give you an idea in places of, you know, where, where you have the information. You will not be able to compare that information across geographies or, or different, as, different parts of the same biome. So it, it's tough. So, I mean, we don't, uh, so uh, I mean, yes, those hexagons are there, but the fact is that they're not available everywhere. So actually, sadly, we don't even have, uh, and certainly not on a global scale. Uh, so, Species richness is not that easy. I mean, you have something called um, uh, uh, the mean species abundance, which is kind of a, a combination of biomass and, and richness. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a hybrid and doesn't necessarily pinpoint the richness aspect. Species rarity, I think that's probably the easy one. Anyone species rarity indicators? Isn't that like the red list? Yeah, red list. Red list is all about species rarity. And that's, that's yeah, gone. Not, not entirely, not, not all of it, but I mean, there's lots but, of... I mean, it's also, that's, it, that's, a, that's an indicator of that, that there are troubles. Yes. So certain species that might be really rare, mm. but aren't in trouble necessarily, we mm. not flag up and that. And again, when you talk about the, the scale at which you're looking, yeah. this, that would be another problem. Yeah. I mean, you, red list will not necessarily have insects and, and unattractive species. Things that people don't fancy will not necessarily be on red list. <laughs> 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 a lot less than. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? Yeah. Amphibians are there, yes. All, all rodents are there. Rodents are there, yeah, that is true, actually. Yeah, you have a point there. Yeah. Uh, they're not, they're not as, as biased as I sometimes <laughs> think them to be. But it, it, it's, it's, not a complete, it's not a complete rarity. The whole, even though IUC has done a great job on, especially with birds and so on, but I don't think it's a complete set of rarity. Biomass? Tough one, actually. It's, it's available. There are lots of area indicators available, and uh, countries usually have these, but everyone seems to measure things uh, when it comes to biomass in different ways. They cut up based on different biomes. They cut up based on different ge geopolitical boundaries. Uh, areas, area maps are available generally, but not on a consistent basis. You can go to Google, and you can get a good area answer, but you will not necessarily get density. For this, you need to get into a more complex 
technological space and, and look at satellite surveys and, and angle surveys and so on, and physical ground mapping of density. So even that is not easy. Primary productivity, well, HANP, actually there's a fair amount of work on human, appropri human appropriation of net primary productivity. So there are good scientific studies on primary productivity. Genetic diversity also, again, not, not, that well, not that well mapped. So I think the point I'm making is that, yes, there's some, um, some effort to, uh, across the world to have indicators which measure what I would consider to be the important dimensions of biodiversity. But unfortunately, it's not complete and in some cases just isn't, isn't satisfactory. So there's a, a huge, huge area of, of uh, um, work, research, and quantification, and uh, analysis of what you've found, and so on, which is still required to really get indicators for biodiversity to capture. If you guys think these are important dimensions of biodiversity, from, especially from a, uh, the point of view of value to human society, then I'm afraid we don't really have very good indicators measuring many of these. And once again, it's a question of seeing what you have and trying to do the best that you can. And very often you'll come up with the very unsatisfying conclusion that this has been measured because it's easy. You very often will find that it's, you know, it's the, the usual uh, you know, bird life phenomenon. Basically, there are lots of birders, they measure birds, and therefore you have very good information and indicators on bird life. But where you do not have that much human interest, or you don't have these, uh, uh, these indicators, you are unfortunately swimming in a space of, of information scarcity. Next, I want to spend a few minutes on, on the story of the 2010 targets. Everyone heard of the 2010 biodiversity targets. Now, the, the whole idea came up uh, for serious consideration at the Johannesburg meeting. And Basically, um, the, the countries that met there came up with this statement, uh, which is that they, had, uh, they wanted to achieve by 2010 a significant reduction of the current rate of biodiversity loss at the global, regional, and national level. Now, can anyone imagine what was complex about this statement? What was difficult about this statement or challenging? Hmm? Sorry. What's that? Measuring, yeah, yeah. And in what ways? Well, firstly, let's begin with biodiversity loss. Do you think that at that point in 2002, anyone got a clear idea as to how much biodiversity loss? No. I mean, the, what is the current rate? I mean, if you, don't, if you haven't defined like what is biodiversity and therefore how are you losing it, how can you speculate on what is the current rate of loss if you haven't like measured it? I mean, if, if a car is moving and you don't know how to measure its speed, how do you know whether it's, it's going fast or slow or accelerating? And here we are talking about not just measuring the rate of, of change. In other words, it's a second order. It's a second order derivative. We are also talking about doing that at the global, regional, and national level. There are huge assumptions here that countries will be able to actually have the data available to be able to measure what they are committing to manage. They are committing to manage the rate of loss of biodiversity and bring it down. But they don't have the information with which to do it. So the fact is that this was recognized at the point that uh, at these nice words were coined. And so within a couple of years, you actually had two large meetings, early in 2004 and then again at the Royal Society in 2004, um, sponsored respectively by UNEP and the Royal Society, whose purpose was basically just get some, get some indicators draped around this, uh, this whole concept of, uh, of the targets, of the 2010 biodiversity targets. And they came up, now at that point they were, uh, it was a mix of people. So it wasn't pure scientists, it wasn't pure policymakers, it was a combination of all of these. So what you have is actually, uh, on the one hand, quite a rich mixture because it's not just about indicators of um, the state of biodiversity, it's also about their sustainable use. And they came up with approximately 18 indicators which were being measured in, in many places, in many parts of the world and a whole wish list of many others which were just not available, which they would like to. Uh, for instance, in terms of forest area, uh, they had forest area, obviously, and they had trends in, in uh, distribution of particular species, and they had deforestation rates. Uh, but they didn't have much indication of the condition of forests, or you know, they didn't have much on wetlands, they didn't have much on 
on the percentage of live coral cover. And we talked, of course, in information has improved since then. So even the whole idea of measuring the components and measuring the state was not complete at that point. Sustainable use, likewise, there was hardly anything that was actually directly measuring how sustainably biodiversity is used anywhere. Uh, threats to biodiversity, there was some information and, and some measurements on nitrogen depositions, but there wasn't much on any of the other areas, uh, especially the, uh, the extent of alien invasions, alien species, or road-free areas, or marine fishing effort, and so on. Uh, ecosystem integrity, a couple of indicators. Look at the massive jungle of indicators which people wanted to measure and have information on versus the two which were actually already being measured. So actually the gap between how much knowledge was available and how much was desired is a massive gap. Now it's narrowed a bit, but not much. And unfortunately, this is still probably the number one challenge in this whole space, is the measurement challenge. It's being addressed by a whole host of uh, uh, organizations under the uh, umbrella of what is called the Biodiversity Indicators Partnership. It's got basically the who's who of biodiversity is part of this partnership. So they are going about it. And the way it's been gone about is, is pretty much the sort of, you know, um, let's get everything on, uh, let's get everything that we can, let's catch everything that moves. And there is therefore a, a sense of uh, you know, alarm at just the sheer size and scale of what needs to be calculated because they're looking at not only the status, but they're also looking at the drivers and pressures. So sustainable use is being measured, threats, they need to measure it, them. Uh, the value of ecosystem services are part of what they want. Then they want to also cater to the needs of communities, basically of tribal communities and of forest communities. And of course, there's a strong interest therefore in uh, measuring the status of traditional knowledge and innovations and practices and finding out how local communities are uh, responding to biodiversity. And they even have indicators like you know, ling linguistic diversity and the number of speakers of indigenous languages as an indicator of biodiversity. I mean, it's a stretch of the imagination out there, but the point is, what do you measure? Again, the point of measure what you can as against what you want to. So there's an element of measure what you can going on. Yes, you can count the number of languages and that gives you a sense of number of indigenous communities and potentially therefore indigenous communities um, uh, assumed interest in, in conservation and so on. So there's, there's that element of, uh, uh, of catering to, if you like, political um, groups as well. And then finally, financing, the, the size and scale of resource transfers into the space of biodiversity financing. Uh, what, is, what is coming through is, is that there's definitely a consensus that we can't only measure the state of biodiversity. We have to look at the drivers, we have to look at the press pressures, and we have to look also at policy responses. And you will be familiar from D1 and from earlier lectures that this, this image of representing biodiversity and ecosystem functions, then identifying the ecosystem service flows out of them, putting values to those flows, getting the TEEP kind of framework, then feeding that back into policy and then the policy feeding back in terms of uh, policy feedback. And then of course, there's the usual natural and human drivers of the change in loss of biodiversity, which then goes on. It's kind of a cycle of information and response. This is, seems to be the direction that most groups are taking when it comes to biodiversity indicators. So that's as much I, have, I want to comment at this point on the biophysical indicators of biodiversity. Now let me go on from there on to uh, the more economic indicators, especially the macro indicators. And of course, those of you who are familiar with this whole space of dissatisfaction with GDP because of the lack of uh, uh, reflection, recognition, and capture of the economic values of ecosystem services uh, will find this deja vu. But let me just run through some of the, the key issues that we have here. Um, which are that how good a measure of well-being. We are ultimately talking about making the case that ecosystem services add to human well-being, for which then we have to ask the question, how good a measure of human well-being is GDP in the first instance? So here, let's look at some examples of what gets counted, accounted for in GDP. GDP is about value addition. It's about value addition. So when people measure GDP, they measure, for example, corporate profits as returns to dividends. Uh, they measure incomes paid or basically salaries paid by, uh, by corporations as value for human labor. They measure interest as in financial interest, in other words, the value for, hum for financial capital. So these are elements of value addition which are measured in GDP. And the question is, what's not measured? Well, so let's look at two counterpoints. For instance, if you, if you have 
a situation where government spending uh, and private spending is increasing because floods and, uh, and droughts have increased as a result of you know, natural capital not being properly managed. Well, that will actually demonstrate itself as an increase in GDP because you know, it will involve government expenditure and involve private uh, companies reaping some profits out of their engagement in that activity. But if at the same time you were trying to reduce flood damage and drought losses by increasing, uh, for instance, forest density and forest cover, that effect would not be captured in, in the GDP metric. If you see an increase in medical spending on rep respiratory diseases, for instance, because there's more pollution, uh, in other words, more hospital spending, that will come up in GDP as an increase in GDP. But if you have laws and policies which are enacted now for uh, trying to reduce uh, ambient pollution levels or, for instance, policies on, or, or rules about cleaner fuels, for instance, well, the value of that is obviously high to human health, but that will not reflect in GDP. If you increase spending, yes? Question. Well, I was just going to say, is, but is that reflected if you reduce ambient air pollution but increase worker productivity, would that be reflected in GDP? I think the work probably doesn't translate one to one. Yeah, that element would be. The, 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 uh, if you, if you could potentially measure uh, daily adjusted life years and you might find an increase in daily adjusted life years and that would reflect ideally in worker productivity and therefore in higher output. But it's a tenuous, it's a sort of two or three stage link. But the direct impact on human health and enjoyment. Well-being is basically the question I'm asking, right? Does this impact well-being? Yes, obviously, because your health has improved. But does it necessarily increase GDP quickly? No, it doesn't. Uh, uh, increase, education is, is a tough one because the, we count it as expenditure. And this is the thing about accounting and national accounting versus other forms of accounting. If you, if you show national accounts to uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in any country, they, they will always have issues with the way national accounting works versus the way that they would like companies to account for themselves. There is a huge gap because national accounting does not follow double entry bookkeeping principles. It does not follow clear distinctions between expenditure and income assets and liabilities. We don't have the sort of balance sheet and PL approach in national accounts that we have in, in the case of corporations. Um, so ideally when you're looking at creating human capital by increasing education expenditure, that'll, that'll show up as uh, an increase in spending on school and university buildings. But what will not reflect in GDP is the higher future incomes that you've created in people by adding to their skill sets, which therefore should be an increase in human capital, but that will not reflect in the GDP accounts or in, in, as in the national accounts or in, in genuine savings. And finally, uh, going back to the tsunami or going back to uh, the Japanese tsunami, I mean, there was a huge uh, repair and reconstruction cost and that it shows as an increase in GDP. In fact, it's quite funny. There was a, I heard an economist on CNBC, a stand chart saying, well, of course, the GDP of Japan will go up now. So he was sort of saying that with, um, in a matter of fact way, which made me laugh. And it's recognized that when you have a disaster, GDP goes up. But that doesn't mean that well-being increases. Obviously, it decreases, right? Because people have lost their lives, their families, their homes, their livelihoods. That's a decrease in human well-being, but it's an increase in GDP in output. Now, in the case of Japan, there was actually a loss in GDP because the extent of damage was so much that a lot of production was actually held up. A lot of factory production was held up in Japan. So there was a temporary blip, uh, a down uh, decline in, in Japanese GDP. But obviously, the reconstruction effort will now kick in, and you will see an increase. So there are, there are aspects of, of, uh, of uh, human well-being, which is what we are trying to argue the case for ecosystem services impacting human well-being. There clearly isn't a good measure of human well-being being delivered out of the current system of national accounts. So we are not going to be able to make our case. The point I'm making is that with that situation, we are not going to be able to make our case because, again, of the economic invisibility of nature. Addressing that economic invisibility means going towards a different form of national accounting where let me talk about two forms of national accounting which can reflect that. One is sort of green accounting and the other is inclusive wealth. So firstly about green accounting, let's look at it in the following way. There are all kinds of ecosystem services which deliver value. At the simplest end of the scale, it's the value that the rural household gets from harvesting fuel wood. That's free, that doesn't reflect anywhere, it's not market price. The question is, can you reflect it in GDP? Sure. Why not? You can always estimate the value, and these estimates can go towards GDP. GDP is itself an estimate. I still remember, Sanjeev, you were there, I think, or, or not, but the, when we launched the first report, there was a lot of angst in India about, you know, how can you, how can you put in such estimates into GDP? And finally, to our defense from the audience came the head of India's statistical office, who is the man who writes the GDP, and he says, GDP is an estimate. 
I don't care whether these are estimates or not. The fact is GDP is also an estimate. Well done. Make sure you disclose. His point was make sure you disclose your estimates. Make sure you declare what your assumptions are. But make the assumptions and make the estimates. So. Yeah. Yeah. There are assumptions involved there as well. And, yeah, yeah. So uh, with green accounting, what you need to do is create a framework which captures and, and integrates these ecosystem services in. And the, the whole process of uh, doing that is mapped out at least at a basic level by a, a manual called the SEEA 2003, uh, the system of uh, economic, environmental and economic accounting. And this, this manual is is still at a basic level because it doesn't actually take an ecosystems approach. It doesn't actually talk ecosystem services. It really focuses more on certain categories like uh, water and especially on forests and, and timber and so on. So it's not complete in the way that we would like it to be, but it's being upgraded. And this is what I'm hoping to get uh, Glenn Murray Lange to talk about. She's uh, managing the World Bank's effort, the World Wealth Accounting and Valuation for Ecosystem Services project and she'll be a visitor at, at some point, either this term or next term. So you'll hear more about how they're going about this. Um, you need to account for the externalities, not just in terms of capital stock, as in loss of forest, in other words, the loss of capital, natural capital, but also account for the flows, the missing fuel wood, the missing nutrients and fresh water. The production of nature, which goes into value into the economy, is not accounted for. If it was human production, it would be because you'd see wages coming in, or you'd see some kind of output being captured, or some kind of co company profits going up. So you would capture that as part of GDP. But if it's not human production, but rather natural production, even though it results in higher well-being, it's not captured today. But the point I'm making is that with green accounting, you can capture it. You can actually work out the production function and see the impact on agricultural production functions of improved flows of fresh water, or of improved flows of nutrients. Right? So you can actually work that out and then say, fine, well, these are components of natural production which are adding to human well-being. They should be reflected in the national accounting framework. You can use contingent valuation techniques, the usual willingness to pay sort of thing, which you guys are, should remember, I hope, uh, even though you finished your tests and stuff, but that doesn't mean you forget them. Uh, hopefully you'll see that that kind of valuation approach and work is useful as, as, as a means of assessing the value of biodiversity, species, ecosystems, and so on. And you can finally, for any accounting period, firstly adjust for the flows. In other words, what were the missing flows that, the, uh, that households have received or that uh, communities have received or individuals have received, and account for those missing income flows. And you can also account for depreciation. Because another thing that the current system of national accounts doesn't do is that even though it depreciates man-made assets, in other words, if factories are lost, then yes, that would be accounted for. And depreciation is accounted for in the national accounting framework. But that's only on man-made assets. Natural assets and the depreciation of those doesn't come in. So even though factory losses or, or losses in, in physical in built infrastructure would be accounted for in genu genuine savings, if it was natural infrastructure, ecological infrastructure, that loss would not be accounted for. And that is, that is a, a, if you like, a disparity, if you like, a, uh, an imbalance that needs, needs to be corrected. So if you do all of these things, if you account for the missing flows, and if you also account for and capture proper depreciation that you are seeing and observing in natural capital, and remember it's natural capital. Sometimes it's an estimate. Usually it's an estimate because these are usually non-market values, and that's part of the challenge. But by estimating the lost flows, the present value of the lost flows using appropriate discount rates, you can work out the loss in natural capital, and you can start reflecting those losses. So all of this is is can be done, and it's basically, this is the framework which is known as green accounting. And what you tend to do is, you would reflect it in a framework which is uh, aligned to the current system of national accounts. So you would present today's national accounts in terms of green GDP and in terms of um, uh, uh, genuine, uh, in terms of savings, and then you'd say, okay, as a result of missing depreciations and as a result of missing flows, here's the adjusted GDP and here's the environmentally adjusted GDP, as we call it, and here's the environmentally adjusted savings, as in genuine savings. So that whole approach is basically known, known as green accounting. But there's another approach, which is in some ways uh, ends up in the same place, but actually is intellectually designed somewhat differently, which 
isn't flow-based uh, in that sense, which is basically about inclusive wealth. A lot of work was done on this early work by uh, Arrow and Partha Das Gupta and, and Carl Leon Mailer, and then finally Arrow's been leading a lot of very good research, uh, more, more sort of empirical work, but applying the theory and looking at how we can measure inclusive wealth. Inclusive wealth is just a way of saying, what's the total stock of capital available to the citizens of a country divided by the number of citizens? In other words, what's the average per capita capital, productive capital available to people? And of course, the current system of national accounts does that as well, but what it doesn't account for is human capital available and natural capital available. Whereas the system that Arrow, Daskopta, and Mailer have introduced basically accounts for all of these other capitals as well. And that's why it's different. That's why it's more holistic and more, more appropriate in capturing human well-being because well-being will come from various kinds of utilities. Some of these are uses of flows coming out of natural capital. Some are uses of flows coming out of human capital, others from physical capital. And the objective is to try and capture that capital asset value overall so that you can get a sense of how much is the wealth of the nation. So they capture physical capital, as, as the system does right now, but also natural capital, both dead natural capital and live. So they're counting for not just forests and freshwater uh, and, and fisheries and so on, but also counting for oil and, and other minerals in subsoil assets. The implication of that is that if you mine a mineral, you've actually lost it. Of course, you've earned some incomes as a result of the sale of that mined material, but you've also lost the capital amount, which is in the ground. So you need to account for not just one side, but the other side of the equation. And then about calculating human capital, that's knowledge and skills, and of course social capital, which is a lot more complicated when you're talking about institutional and legal inst infrastructure. It's quite difficult to quantify even today uh, when you get to this side of, of, of the equations. Once again, as with the green accounting, you will have once in a while to make use of contingent valuation techniques and to make use of the other valuation techniques that you're familiar with. And finally, you need to present them in a form which is digestible, and that tends to be in the form of inclusive wealth. And you have to bear two things in mind. One is that population changes, so population changes with time. So if the capital stock of a country is static, that's not necessarily a good thing because populations may be increasing, and therefore the average capital stock is not, is not increasing. And the second is the productivity of that capital, and therefore the total factor productivity across natural capital, human capital, and physical capital is also important because the question is how much stuff, goods and services and, and utility and therefore well-being is being derived from that. If you're doing things which, is, which, is, which are impairing or damaging the productivity of your forms of capital, that's not very good because that is impacting future well-being. So we have to recognize these two other additional di dimensions in terms of population as well as factor productivity. So let's look at some numbers. So this, these numbers are, have been pulled together from the work that Arrow and, and the others have done. Um, can any, everyone read them, from, especially from the back? Or do you want to come up front? Because these are some fairly interesting and recent numbers. Now, what they've done here, and, and I've kept some areas blank for us to discuss, but what they've done is to calculate the domestic net investment in these countries. And um, the right-hand column gives what is the adjusted net investment, the adjusted increase in, in net savings. So let's look, for instance, at the Middle East and North Africa. Now, there they have a domestic net investment of $14.7 per capita, whereas if you work it out on a genuine net investment basis, it becomes minus $7 per capita. Okay, so can anyone take a guess as to why this should be happening? Why is there such a huge gap in the Middle East, in MENA, basically, between domestic net investment on the one hand and genuine investment on the other, on the basis of what I've just described to you, uh, what is inclusive wealth. Kevin? Mineral depletion, absolutely, yeah. That is a factor, and it's not the only factor, so let's look at what's happening here. Mineral depletions of the order, and what is basically what they're calling energy depletions, that's oil. The Middle East is about oil, right? Here you see it, that loss of oil, the drawing out of oil uh, is actually being reflected in value terms because it has a value in the soil. If it's out, it's not there anymore. That means you've lost that asset. Of course, you've made some use of it. You've crystallized some economic value by its sale or by its use. But at the same time, you've lost the asset. So you need to account for that. That's what double entry bookkeeping is about. You could, if, you, if you 
debit some cash flows, you've got to credit the actual asset, i.e. reduce the asset that you've got. But unfortunately, because of the traditional approach, we don't do that in, in, in GDP accounting. Bear in mind, that's not the only thing that's changing. It's not just energy. So if it were just for energy, that gap would be different. But there is one additional one, which is education expenditure. So they are adding back the $4.7 of education expenditure per capita. So it's not the case that nobody is adding human capital. Human capital is being added as a result of education. So this is basically the element of GDP, which is expenditure on education, which is being added back in the form of capital because you are building that human capital. And of course, this is the cost-based approach, right? So there, you can also follow an income-based approach in valuing human capital. Um, that's, there's a paper by Jorgensen and Fraumeni, 1989, which is worth reading. It's a really good way of, it specifies how to use the income-based approach for measuring human capital. But this is the cost-based approach. So the answer out there is the net of all of these numbers. It's that plus this, minus this, minus this, minus this, minus that. Okay? So that's how we do it. I want to just discuss one more country, and then you guys can play around with these numbers and, and figure them out for yourselves. But is anyone familiar with Nepal and what's, what's happening there in terms of forests? Nepal? Anyone? Deforestation. Quite a significant amount of deforestation. So you'd expect, you'd expect because of that deforestation, Nepal is the third row, or the third number from there. So domestic net investment, $14.8. And on the right-hand side, you see genuine investment, $13.31. Now, it doesn't look like a huge amount. It would suggest that there's hardly anything changing in terms of natural capital losses. But there is something else. Can anyone imagine why this would be, even though there is high deforestation in Nepal, why would the net domestic, the genuine investment be not very different from the unadjusted investment? Any guesses? Yeah. I mean, just based on the Well done. That's exactly right. Well done. That's exactly what's happening. Because there is serious investment in education taking place. So education expenditure, when you add that back in Nepal, is, is, is not a small number. It's $2.65. And yes, of course, there's net forest depletion. So the thing about this inclusive wealth approach is that it doesn't really recognize, or at least doesn't sort of address the fact that just by having more educated people doesn't mean that you can lose forests, or just by having more forests doesn't mean that you can not educate people. But the point is, it's an accounting approach. It's better than nothing. It's better than doing nothing on either of these counts. That's the point. And that's why inclusive wealth is, is getting some traction, at least within the, within the expert community. And you can see the rest of the numbers. I mean, it's, it's a combination of one of the above. It's just one or the other, which is always uh, a key driver, and then there are other numbers. So this is an interesting approach, which is being, um, being uh, worked upon these days. The data is from the World Bank, and I hope that when Glenn Marie Lange comes in, yes, question out there. Oh, I'm just thinking about the Middle East and the energy depletion. Mm. You know, how fair is it to attribute that to decreased capital there when we're the ones using it? Most of it isn't being used there, mm. and so okay. It, no, it just uh, seems to be kind of the, the point is valid, but the way to look at this is that. This, is, this capital, this natural capital, belongs to the countries of the Middle East. So if they've drawn it out and they've done something with it, either use it themselves or sell it, more likely sell it, right? Because that's where it's going. They've crystallized some cash value as a result of that sale. So their reserves have gone up or their private companies who are operating in that space have gone up, the domestic components of that. And places like Saudi Arabia, basically Saudi Aramco, which is getting most of the money in. So, there is a value addition that has taken place in cash terms as a result of the sale of that natural resource. You are accounting for that in your national accounting framework. How can you not account for the depletion of that stock? I, 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 I take the point on equity, which is that who's actually using this? In other words, who's determining the price at which this is happening? And are they getting enough for the oil? Maybe not, right? That may be the case. But the point is they are getting something, and there is a way versus that of measuring the value and specifying a value for oil under the ground and you should account for both, not just one side. So it's basically the double entry which is, which is happening here. Uh, in the interest of time, let's move on. Um, so comprehensive wealth. Now, these are, these are uh, study numbers from the same group of uh, people, Arrow and the others. And they're just for five countries where they've taken this as far as they can, accounting for the fact that factor productivity matters and that the number of people matter. So here's the 
the unadjusted numbers, that is the, the comprehensive wealth growth rates. Now, those calculations earlier, which I showed you are in dollar terms, these are in percentage terms, percentage per annum, okay? And this applies across a, a five-year period that they selected between whatever, is it 95 and 2000 or something? Yeah, okay. So here were the numbers that they had unadjusted numbers in terms of comprehensive wealth growth. And you can see that some countries are doing better than others. China is high, India is high, whatever. Venezuela is not, not that high. But this hadn't accounted for population, right? Because population is clearly changing. Not surprisingly, India's population is growing fast. Uh, so that's one reason why, it's, that's not the only reason, that's one reason why you see a drop from 2.6 to 1.74 in terms of adjusting for population growth. But it's not just about population. You need to also look at, after you've accounted for the population, sorry, these are the population growth rates. Sorry, I got that wrong. Population growth rates in that column then the net amount is after population growth rate. So 2.6 minus 1.74 growth would bring India down to 0.86. If you compare that to China, they have a much lower population growth rate, and that brings you down to 2.9. So the gap there is, is smaller. So then you get to a net after accounting for population growth, or increase in, or decrease as it happens in comprehensive wealth. But even that's not the full picture because you have to figure out what's been happening to factor productivity, the productivity of your capital during the process of these, of whatever policies you've implemented during these five years. So you have to measure the growth rate in total factor productivity. Once you've done that, then you do a further set of adjustments and then you get to, if you like, the adjusted per capita comprehensive growth rate after adjusting for population growth and after adjusting for total factor productivity growth. So you can see that where you began with an unadjusted number comprehensive growth rate and where you end up is actually quite different. We see that as a result of factor productivity increases in China, you're seeing their comprehensive growth rate going up from 3.8 to 5.6, whereas in the case of Venezuela, due to declines in factor productivity, um, and of course population growth, which is everywhere, uh, you're seeing a decline from plus 1.15 all the way down to minus 2.94. So there, there are very significant perspective changes as, as you look at these numbers in an unadjusted form and when you start adjusting them for population growth on the one hand and for total fat factor productivity changes on the other. So this approach is good because it, it recognizes that. Now having said that, even this group has only done these calculations for these five countries. So this is still in, in early stages, it's formative stages right now. Let me talk a bit about uh, uh, the, and sorry that's, that's the full picture here. So you can see China um, 5.6 as against 3.8, and you can see India at 2.7 versus 2.6, and Venezuela showing a sharp decline in flag to flip as against an increase, a decrease in, in, uh, in comprehensive wealth. Secondly, I want, I want to look at uh, how we bring in and think about HDI, and recognize that HDI is just an indicator, which is why it will not necessarily give you the same answer or even the same direction of answers when you look at comprehensive wealth. Because HDI, is, as I may remind you, is about a combination of GDP and about longevity and about schooling, right? So it's not necessarily the case that those measures will give you the same answer if you look at a measure like comprehensive wealth. And you can see this in, in, the, in the example out here. Where if you look at comprehensive wealth per head versus GDP per head, in all these cases, HDI is actually increasing. But it's not the case that comprehensive wealth is increasing in all cases. In fact, only in the case of China, in this example, are we seeing, uh, seeing an increase in comprehensive wealth in, those, in the years that we are talking about, 1970 to 2000. So there is a difference. These, this is an example of two different indicators giving you two different answers for human well-being. If you follow the HDI route, you might conclude that everyone's doing better. If you follow the comprehensive wealth measure, which I believe to be a superior measure because it's, using quanti it's trying to quantify these aspects, then I think you come to a different answer. And this is possible, and that's part of the challenge. Yeah. How much of this is accounted for just population? Um, well, it's a bit of both, right? It's population as well as factor productivity. So the reality is, and population growth is real, because resources available to the people, if you've had very high growth in population, there's less resource per person. So the fact that HDI isn't actually focused on that is, is probably a problem. But at the same time, HDI does look at two important things, as in longevity and schooling years. But that's not 
that's not a total picture. That's really the challenge with using an indicator of the HDI kind versus using a more accounting measure like uh, inclusive wealth. And frankly, from the perspective, and this is there's, there's neither here nor there, but it's, it's a valid point to make that if you look at HDI, it'll be quite difficult to justify, it'll be quite a tenuous argument to try and bring in ecosystem services. Whereas if you look at a comprehensive wealth approach, you can bring them in directly through natural capital and being one of the three uh, uh, counts that you're looking at. I mean, this is just a visual representation of, of uh, the big difference between GDP as a measure of national performance and comprehensive wealth as a measure of national performance. You can see that in some countries, the answers are somewhat aligned, as in China and the UK. But there are other countries like uh, the Middle East and North Africa, where they're completely misaligned. Bangladesh, where they're misaligned. India, where they're misaligned. So looking at GDP versus looking at comprehensive wealth will give you very, very different answers for performance. Our challenge today is that after 60 years of national accounting based on GDP, everyone's kind of fixated on that. The press understand it. The policy, well, people think they understand it. The press, the politicians, the decision makers. And the challenge here is how do you get a different measure to be brought into mental space? And it is quite difficult. And that is why sometimes doing a big flip between a GDP approach on the one hand and a wealth approach on the other may be the more challenging route. And that's why people who are in favor of green accounting, including myself, say that, why don't you look at green accounting? Because it's a via media. It may not be intellectually as clean as doing comprehensive melt, but at least you can make a point relative to GDP. You, people will understand it more easily who are decision makers, who are not familiar with the economics and accounting for all this. Uh, at least they'll understand it better because they're at least familiar with its easier comparison with GDP. Uh, just a quick flick through, and I will try and be speedy because we have only a short time left, but uh, accounting for uh, natural capital has been a key recommendation of TEEP, and it's one of the key demands that have been made of TEEP as to get involved in this whole space of greening national accounts. And where national products have, projects have become like in India, it's very much there. They, there's a target 2015 uh, for getting GDP you know, in green domestic product form, as in green accounts form, by 2015. That may or may not happen, but at least India has a strong case because some of the work that's been done by the Green Accounting Project for India, which, by the way, was a private project, which involved uh, Sanjeev and Rajiv and myself uh, and uh, a few others whom you've not seen on the, on the TEEP course, but they're participants in the TEEP analysis. Um, at least that work is there. So the, methodology, the framework and the methodology are already there. Now it's a question of taking the data and moving it forward and getting more recent and better data into this entire accounting process. So those who haven't seen these before, and if you're interested um, to pursue it later on, there are these six and soon to be eight uh, booklets. Basically, these are uh, specific studies of particular sectors like agriculture, uh, forestry. There are three studies on various dimensions of forestry. Education, human education is really important in India especially because it's been a huge value driver. And freshwater, the quality of freshwater, uh, is, is a very important aspect of national wealth, which doesn't get reflected. But the work has been done, and it demonstrates that green accounting can produce meaningful answers. And I'll just talk a little bit about in the remaining five, 10 minutes. Is everyone OK for 10 more minutes? Yeah, no, yes, no, maybe. <laughs> Let me try to run through. So firstly, oh, what happened here? Looks like we lost the map of India. So that it, if you had the map of India, you'd see that forests are a fairly uh, are a patchwork. It covers ostensibly, uh, officially, 20% uh, of the area, although the environmental NGOs will tell you that's rubbish, and it's actually 12%. And you know, you'll never get the twain to agree, because all kinds of satellite measures get twisted in all kinds of ways to come up with an answer of how much, India, how much of India is actually under forest cover, how much is plantation forest and non-plantation forest, how much is dense versus open forest, and so on. You get all kinds of arguments. It's really fascinating. Um, but uh, anyone who's got difficulty measuring should go to India because that difficulty becomes difficulty squared because there are opinions and views which are directly in conflict with each other. So getting into Indian databases is just amazing. You know, you, you, the moment you touch them, you've made a political statement, actually. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the quick background on India's forests is that they are significant. Whether the answer is 20% or 12%, I don't know. And, and frankly, we have to go with a set of data because it's all relative. We are measuring relative to one date versus the other. So you have to go with one set of data which you kind of trust and understand the extraction of and measure how it moves from time to time. Um, the value that forests deliver are much, is much higher than their official recognition in GDP accounts. Uh, 
official recognition is only 1.5% of GDP. The reality is that even if you measure uh, what comes in terms of agricultural production and the impact of ecosystem quality on agricultural production, the answers are much bigger than that. Uh, they are also very significant. It's estimated that something like 350 million people in rural India and in forest areas depend on their livelihoods on, in some form or the other, the output from forested areas. So there's a significant social dimension here as well, which needs to be recognized. And of course, there's the quantitative uh, aspects are quite interesting because state-wise, now, why states and why doing green accounting on a state level? Well, in India, forests are a state subject. States determine how forest policies are run and how forests are managed. So you can go about measuring things on a national level. It's theory. It doesn't matter. Nobody's interested. It's everybody's problem, and therefore it's nobody's problem. So if you want to have impact, if you want end users to look at your data, you have to measure it at the state level. And this was a challenge in which Sanjeev, who's sitting right here, had the brilliant idea of going down to national databases and drilling into them because they're always collected at the state level. Measuring it at the state level would have meant one political battle at a time, 27 times. But measuring it from national databases compiled at the state level gave us the ability, our group, the ability to actually go ahead and do state level accounting whilst not necessarily visiting every state. Although we did detailed, uh, I did a visit to Himachal Pradesh because we found some surprising answers there, but I'll describe that in a minute. So we have to look at it at the state level, and you have to recognize that there are certain aspects of India's forest biomass which are quite interesting. One is that it's relatively low density compared to a global average, and it's quite, uh, quite significantly diverse across states. There are some states with less than 3% and other states with 87% forest cover. There are three of these monographs, of these eight monographs, are relevant for the forest area. And the framework that we have set up for forest accounting follows the SEEA framework, but it's not exactly equal to it because you need to take it one step further. SEEA does not, the SEEA 2003 does not actually uh, have much to say about ecosystem services and reflecting them in the accounting framework. And that's why we've had to make our own statements and assumptions. Now, the physical accounting framework uh, for timber and, and carbon uh, is important because before you monetize, you need to capture physical values, as in how much carbon, how much timber. And that's also an interesting point because you can't have both carbon values and timber values for the same forest. So we've taken the view that if a forest is protected, let's believe it is protected and it's not going to be felled for timber. The reality is, of course, different. But then let us calculate its value as a carbon store and reflect that, try and capture that. Whereas if it's a forest, it is a private forest, yes, it was there for the purpose of use and timber will be one of the key uses. So then let's look at its timber value. That's how we've gone about it in this case. Um, there, you have to look at the data and the data availability is high at one level because there are lots of databases that are capturing it and is also low in another way because very often the databases are in conflict with each other. Even land areas, if you look at the forest cover definition based on the agriculture ministry versus the environment ministry, there are differences. The Agriculture Ministry's classification of land which is forested is different from the Environment Ministry's. And you have to take a plunge and say, okay, we are going with this one because, and state your assumptions. Uh, calculating opening stocks. The, remember, this is about accounting. So the first thing is, what's the opening stock? Then the next thing is, what are the changes that have happened? And therefore, what is the closing stock? And then working out the changes in stock. If it's a negative, there's a depreciation you have to account for. Working out the flows of ecosystem services during that period. And those are additional flows that you have to account for. Pretty much you know, the way that you do it in, in double entry bookkeeping. That you have to account for both the stocks and the flows. Uh, there is also unrecorded production. Uh, very often, that is pretty significant. And some of it is logged. So you need to put in estimates of how much of unrecorded production is there accumulated and how much of it is lost in logging. And these are some of just, I'm just taking you through these. Those who are interested can go back to the PowerPoint and, and uh, come to the detail. I'm happy to discuss these. But there are several assumptions you have to, to make, like timber is lost due to forest fires. How much? That's important because that's part of the degradation that's taking place. It's natural. It's normal. It happens. It's not pernicious or anything, but it just is normal. And yet it's quite different. Yeah, it is part of depreciation. If you don't capture that, then your depreciation numbers will be wrong. And very often you have an overall estimate and you don't have area estimates. So you have to work backwards and find out what is your area estimate. 
Shifting cultivation creates losses, but at the same time, there's a compensatory factor because people move and then forests regenerate. So it's not as if shifting cultivation has only one aspect of impact, it has two. There is a regeneration of, of forest in some areas which you have to account for as well. So these are some of the, the intricacies that you need to look at. When forests are lost to fire, how do you work out carbon losses? You, you have a situation where you have to make an assumption as to what's actually lost. Of course, the main stem will be lost, but not all the biomass is lost, some of it remains. So you need to work that out and put in estimated numbers for that and so on and so forth. There are also flows from one uh, ecological zone into another. For instance, some of the losses that take place in the forest are conversely increases in soil biomass. So soil biomass and therefore soil productivity will improve if there's a forest fire, will increase as a result of, of this. So you need to recognize that there are flows from one uh, ecological zone into the other and map those because you need to measure the impacts on the other side. Uh, when we talk about two methods, these are basically the net price method focuses largely on timber and the weighted price method, which is what we followed, focuses on timber and fuel wood. And the weightage is different. And once again, it's the state that determines what is the weightage. So the weight of fuel wood, which is a very important output from forests and is again outside of the, of the economic accounting system, uh, is got to be estimated. And once you've done all that, this is the sort of result that you see. And this is basically, a, I think, um, a waterfall kind of diagram, which you begin with your net domestic product, whatever it is you have to first subtract the unadjusted GDP. The system of national accounts will have an, a number, as I mentioned, it's 1.5%. So you have to take that out. Then you have to add back what is your estimate of the real uh, income flows, the real output of the forest, which is including timber, fuel wood, and other ecosystem services, add that back. So then you get actually an answer which is higher than you originally began as the value of forestry to net domestic product. And then you've got to account for the losses. And in this period, as it happened, the losses were not very high. So the environmentally adjusted domestic product, EDP as it's called, was actually higher than the NDP in this particular example. But once again, this happens to be the case in that period. And when we drilled down to find out why this was, we found that the reason for these, these are just the numbers, uh, we found that the reason for these was that in the northeastern states in India, there was actually forest accumulation taking place, which was compensating for a lot of the losses in the other states of India. So once again, an average India number is truly meaningless because what's happening in one place does not meaningfully compensate the other. Northeastern India is our natural Pradesh largely, as, as you would know, you would remember, Sanjeev, that we found there was huge accumulations taking place there, which was one of the reasons why uh, the answers were different. So there, the ratio of environmentally adjusted state domestic product was actually versus national, uh, versus the, the net state domestic product was greater than one. And for the other states, it was less than one. Um, we found particularly that, and this is the, the surprising result, is that if we break up these national numbers by state, we found that the northeastern states in India were net positive. There were huge losses showing up in Himachal Pradesh and in Goa, and then the rest of India was kind of flat. So this was a very interesting spread of results across states. And we naturally drilled down into that and did a, uh, an analysis. I flew down to Simla and spent a lot of time with the forest department. And uh, thankfully, at that particular point, the forest secretary was a friend of mine, so it was easy. I, God help me if that had happened was a different kind of forest secretary at that time. But these things matter. So we, we got the story. We got the story out as to what is the reason why this is happening. And the reason is due to something called the TDS. That doesn't mean tax deducted at source. It means tree distribution scheme. Himachal Pradesh had something called the tree distribution scheme where locals were allowed to harvest wood. And the rate of harvest was huge. So the principal uh, hardwood species called the deodar was being lost very rapidly, in fact, was being depleted horrendously fast. And this was the main reason why we were seeing significant losses of forest density. So it was actually correct. The numbers, the ground truthing exercise of going there, talking to the environment department, checking out what was going on on the ground actually was true, that there was a significant loss. And not surprisingly, it was being picked up in, in the measurements and therefore being reflected in the adjusted GDP. Uh, incidentally, in Goa, it's because of illegal mining in forest areas. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so we didn't know that, but now we do. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.
Now, the overall numbers, I'm sorry, these are a bit small for those sitting, sitting further away. The overall numbers are worth measuring uh, at two levels. Once again, you need to recognize that the adjusted GDP is a result of original GDP plus the incomes that you've not accounted for minus the depreciation that you've not accounted for. Sometimes one compensates the other exactly. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. So if you want to get to the truth, you need to know both the changes in flows that you're not accounted for and the, the depreciation in stock that you're not accounting for. And that's why it's important. And you can see these in the two different colors of yellow. And the fact is that if you look at capital losses, we are talking about stock adjustments in across the whole of the country at minus 9% of annual GDP. That's one hell of a big number. 9% of India's GDP, we're talking about hundreds of billion, 100 billion plus dollars at, even at that time. That's a huge amount of stock loss to take place during this accounting period, 2002, 2003. And of course, compensating there, there is some income as well. So it's not, it's not just one-sided. But the fact is, the flow adjustments are small compared to the stock adjustments. And they can see the significance. But if you talk about inclusive wealth, they don't know what they're comparing with. And even though the inclusive wealth number is, I believe, a more scientific and rational way of addressing the problem, it becomes more difficult from a communications point of view. So anyway, that was, the, uh, uh, that was some of the results from the Indian study that uh, some of us had done a few years ago. In, in, in summary, what did we learn from this in terms of the experience of the green accounting for Indian space project? Well, I think what we learned is that green accounting is possible, but there are lots of challenges. One is data is imperfect. So the answer is not to throw up your hands and say, I can't use imperfect data. But the fact is, data is always imperfect. I have never, as a businessman, I've never come across a situation where I, I had all the information available to make a decision. You always work with imperfect information. So also it is in the case of natural capital assessments. So the key thing is to be consistent, be transparent, disclose your assumptions, but make the assumptions. Because without that, you just can't move forward. Second was about transparency, that it is important, as people have said, to us many times, they appreciate the fact that we state our assumptions and it's all there. If you wish to change them, provide the spreadsheet so people don't like the rate at which you've assumed depreciation, go ahead, change it. It's your, I mean, it's, it's your exercise. So you can change, provide the spreadsheets together with the, with the statement so that people can make their own changes. The third lesson that we learned was comparability and it is really important because if you provide just a calculation of inclusive wealth and it's not comparing that inclusive wealth with anything else, uh, you lose people, you lose policymakers because they don't know what you're talking about. It takes too much time for them to digest. If you compare them with GDP, it's a huge challenge. It's a shock to begin with sometimes, depending on which state they come from, but they get it and then you have a meaningful dialogue. Lastly, we have to pick policy relevant sectors. If we just picked on species diversity, interesting for certain NGOs and interesting maybe to some of you and to me, but it's of no interest to the policymakers unless he sees this is important. He sees this in terms of a policy which is relevant like freshwater. Yes, he has water scarcity. Suddenly, whatever you are saying about freshwater quality losses becomes important for him. If you talk about incomes for the poor, if, you're, if you've picked a number which is important from that perspective, you will get across to the policymaker because you've picked on freshwater and you've picked on, on, uh, uh, on, on the, the wealth of the poor and the impacts there. And finally, um, I think the ease of communication is kind of artificial because as Sanjeev mentioned a short while back, in fact, GDP is itself an estimate. Frankly, I think people believe they understand GDP. Not many of them actually do. And there are all kinds of things that are, not, that are done in GDP accounting in India and, and other places which don't follow the theoretical best approach of GDP accounting. There are all kinds of estimates being made, but people don't know that. So you kind of have to get there slowly, step at a time and say that, look, you know, Here's how it's done and here's what you need to change and this is what changes are required. And the last thing we learned is that uh, resource scarcity applies in the area of green accounting. People are scarce. You know, for instance, I was once discussing this with a friend at the World Bank uh, who was very enthusiastic about the WAVES project he, because she said, we have 3,000 economists. I said, hmm, that's very good. So how many of those are actually natural resource economists? Then she started frowning. Mm, maybe about 50. And I said, great, 50 is a good number. How many of those have actually also got experience in GDP accounting. And it was literally like, mm, well, maybe three or four. So from 3,000, we are down to like three or four people at actually the world's premier institution when it comes to the skill set. This is a highly rare skill set, and that's part of the challenge, getting enough people. In fact, um, even with the Indian case, it was fortunate that we had 
people like Pushpam and, and Haripriya who had direct personal experience of GDP accounting and natural resources and therefore it was possible to do this project. But this is a huge developmental challenge. People have to be educated and created in this space. Thank you very much indeed.